Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Going to do another round of questions today. Always be aware of what someone might tell you. God's Word warns us over and over about false prophets. Jeremiah chapter 23, Ezekiel chapter 13, it says how they, that they say God saith it, but, but He didn't say it. Many times someone might claim to be some man or woman of God, but many times God didn't send them. If you cannot prove something in the Bible, do not believe it. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-3 through 3, talks about how they bring in damnable heresies, and they make merchandise of you, often begging for money. It's obvious when someone that's all they care about. So do not get ripped off. Do not get taken advantage of. You stick to God's word. God warns us over and over to beware of false prophets. Anything anyone says, do not believe it unless you can prove it straight from the Bible. That goes for anything I say or anything or anyone else. If you cannot prove it in the Bible, don't believe it. Let's get into some questions. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father. We thank you so much for your word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. All right, first question we have, Chris and Starlet from Texas. We have followed Yahweh's instruction in anointing with olive oil when asking for healing, but we have never gathered the elders as instructed. We do not live near a church that teaches us Smyrna or Philadelphia. And for someone who might not know, there's seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, but there's only two that God didn't have something against, and that was Smyrna and Philadelphia. So continuing, do you think it matters that we haven't fulfilled that part of the instruction? We know Yahweh will do what He wills. However, we want, it to, we want to be obedient. Do you have any additional insight? We do value your educated opinion. Thank you. And they're referring to James chapter 5, verse 14 through 16, where it says, If any be sick, let them call for the elders of the church and pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and God will raise them up. And if they have sins, they'll be forgiven. It says, uh, pray for one another that you may be healed. Confess your faults one to another. The prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But so they're saying that, that they don't have a church to go to that teaches the truth with elders to ask. And you certainly wouldn't. Uh, well, I'm going to mention Mark chapter 5, verse 35 through 43. Um, people were saying uh, there was a man, he was asking Christ to heal his daughter. But they were saying, oh, she's dead. But what did Christ say? He said, be not afraid, only believe. And uh, you know who Christ, he, he didn't just say, hey, everyone come in here. No, he only took Peter, James, and John with him. And then uh, Christ said, the damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Then some other people, they started laughing Jesus Christ to scorn. So then what did he do? He put them out. When it's time for a healing, you put the non-believers out. And you take people that you know truly believe. So I totally understand where you're coming from. I mean, if you just went to some random church with people that might claim to be elders, you don't know what they believe. You don't know if they truly have the faith. So no, I think it's absolutely acceptable that just you and anyone that you know that truly believes that sticks to the truth of God's Word, I think that would absolutely apply as an elder as far as that scripture goes. And because, I mean, think about it, and I wanted to mention how Christ, would, He would say to, to the damsel, He would say, Talitha kumi, and she, damsel arise, and she did rise. Christ healed her, but He put out the non-believers. And, uh, and make note of Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. It says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. So just because someone might claim to be an elder, that doesn't mean they truly serve Jesus Christ. So no, I think you're absolutely in good standing. I don't think you need to go 
just because some building might call itself a church and some might call themselves an elder. It, it maybe it'd be different if you did know of a church that did teach the truth and you knew that it had elders that stuck to the truth that truly believe and then you wanted to call those elders. Yeah, that'd be a good thing. But no, I think you're in great standing that you just, those that you know believe that will be a partaking in that anointing with the olive oil, I think you're in absolutely great standing with that. We don't know this person's name. If I may ask you a hard question, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, is this verse talking of Paul considering it's, of, considering it's Ephesus? And uh, no, it's not talking of Paul. And I'm just going to read Revelation chapters 2, 1 through 5. I think that will be the easiest way to go about this. I was starting to write some of it down in the verses and I was writing down like the whole first five verses and I'm like, why don't I just go to the Bible and read it there? So, and we just mentioned Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Seven churches mentioned. Five of them God found fault with. This church of Ephesus is one that God did find fault with. So, let's go to Revelation chapter 2 verse 1. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And we know from Revelation chapter 1, verse 13 through 20, that this is speaking of Jesus Christ here. And the, you see in verse chapter 1, verse 20, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. God interprets so much for you. God's word interprets itself. So we have Jesus Christ here, the one who walks in the midst of the seven golden, can golden candlesticks. Verse 2, now this is uh, speaking to the church of Ephesus. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Didn't just take someone's word for it, because they claim to be an apostle. So they're doing pretty good so far. 3, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. And I wonder if when you read that verse, maybe, in, and you said verse 2 though, you said it reminded you of Paul, you're asking if it was of Paul. But you keep, let's keep reading verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. That means they stopped truly serving Jesus Christ. So you know for a 100% fact, that is absolutely not speaking about Paul. And also, it's about a 99.99% .99 chance that Paul, that he had already died in the flesh at this time that Revelation was written. Well, that to stop truly serving Jesus Christ is what they did. And what's the ultimate prophecy of that? People who are deceived and worship the false Christ. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And it says multiple times in the teaching of those seven churches to repent. It also says about seven or eight times, it says, speaks of those who overcome. You have to overcome, that means you have to do something. In one of the churches, it says, it's, it teaches how it's not good to be lukewarm. You've got to make a choice. Stand up for our Heavenly Father. And with those seven churches, the, the two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that God found no fault with, both of those churches mention those who claim to be Jews and do lie and are the synagogue of Satan. So I would ask you the question, do you know who they are? Have you been taught that in your church? Richard from Ohio. When Jesus was on the cross in the book of Mark, does he describe Deborah in Greek and Hebrew in Sean's concordance? I noticed a little difference in Mark compared to Matthew and Luke. And uh, no, it doesn't have anything to do with Deborah there, but I know what you're talking about, how it's a little different. So Mark chapter 15, verse 34, it says, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabbatini, which is to be interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then in, um, in Matthew 
thought I wrote the verse down, but I didn't. But in Matthew, it'd be chapter 27, I believe, somewhere. Christ would say, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani. But it's just slightly different. And the reason is in Mark, um, it, it's in the Aramaic. But in, um, in Matthew, it's, uh, it's in the Hebrew. So that's why it, it's a slightly different. But, uh, but he's still saying the same thing. I mean, it, it means the same thing. And it's interesting how in that place in Mark, it's Aramaic. And also that Talithi Kumi that we mentioned in a previous uh, question, that is Aramaic also. But um, so w w let's explain this, though. Uh, so what, what, some people read that and they say, oh, Jesus Christ was forsaken by the Father on the cross. That's not what it means at all. Christ was quoting Psalm chapter 22, verse 1, where David says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But you see, Psalm chapter 22, it's David speaking, but it's a twofold prophecy. And Psalms 22 is giving you detail by detail a prophecy of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ hundreds of years before it happened. And you even see in Psalm chapter 22, verse 24, it says, When he cried out, he heard. I mean, the Father heard when you cried out. I mean, he doesn't turn his face away from you. So the reason Christ said, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He wasn't saying that the Father forsook him. No, he was quoting Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. He was teaching us, even on the cross, he was teaching us, go read Psalms 22, that the crucifixion was prophesied hundreds of years before it ever even happened. Only God can do that. And th those are those two places in Mark I mentioned there's Aramaic. There is other places in the scriptures where the Aramaic is used. But one thing I think is very interesting is we have it here and even connecting with the crucifixion, how he used the Aramaic there when, when it was written. And then also that Talithi Kumai, what did that have to do? That had to do with the girl basically coming back from the dead. I mean, they thought she was dead at least. But Christ says she's not dead, but she sleepeth. So we have that connected with even a death and kind of like a resurrection. I thought that was pretty interesting right there. Debbie from Michigan. Methuselah in Genesis chapter 5. What or who dies before the flood comes? Do you see a second witness by chance? And so now it, it is given to you when you, um, in Genesis chapter 5, you have the seed line of Adam. And, uh, well, Cain's not there. Well, I hope that you know why. But so in Genesis chapter 5, you might make note of 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. But so in Genesis chapter 5, it's teaching you, it'll say like, um, uh, it mentions a bunch of people there, but it will say like a certain person uh, begat, uh, gave birth or uh, begat a certain person and then lived for, for this amount of time after it. And like, uh, for example, I can't think of any exact specific, but let's just say so-and-so was, uh, was 65 years old when he begat a certain child and then he lived for however many years after that. But so when you connect all these dates, you are able to find the answer to your question because you find out in Genesis chapter 7 verse 6 that Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. So when you connect all these dates, you can get the example. And it's awesome. In your companion Bible on the right side of your page, it will, it will basically do the math for you. It will, I mean, you still have to do some work for sure, but it makes it much easier to configure when it's giving you those dates there on the left-hand side. But so what, what it ends up coming out to is that you mentioned, you mentioned Methuselah. So first I'm going to mention Lamech, who is one of the very last persons mentioned um, in one of the last in Genesis 5. When you do all the math, you see that Lamech died five years before the flood. And then when you do the math on Methuselah, he lived to be 969 years old. Methuselah died in the exact same year. That, uh, that the flood came. Now, I absolutely do not think that Methuselah died in the flood, but that he died in just earlier in that same year. And what I thought was um, 
very, very interesting is that uh, when you learn, when you look up in your Strong's what Methuselah, what his name means, it means man with a dart or like man with a weapon. And uh, it's even, it's also interesting that when Methuselah's name is written in the New Testament in Luke chapter 3, someone would even translate that as um, uh, there, there shall be an omission or there shall be a sending out. And I think basically what happened is that pretty much as soon as Methuselah died, God sent the flood. And so I, I thought that was, that's some very interesting stuff there. Denise from Indiana. Is there a special significance why Isaiah chapter 44 verse 2 speaks to Jacob? You put in parentheses Israel, which Jacob does speak of all 12 tribes. And Jeshurun, and then you have in parentheses only three places in Pentateuch that this is referenced. And that's true. The word Jesh Jeshurun is only used three times in the book of Deuteronomy and in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 2. For some who might not be aware, the Pentateuch just means the first five books of the Bible. So, so Jeshurun, the first place, it's, first of all, I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 44, verse 2, the scripture that you mentioned. It says, Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. And so Jeshurun is just simply another name for Israel. And um, if you look it up in your strongest concordance, it will say it means upright. But when you look up at it, I thought this is interesting. In the Smith's Bible Dictionary, it'll tell you that it means uh, supremely happy. Now, when you connect all those different scriptures, like I said, it's, it's just another name for Israel. But it mentions how Israel is, uh, that's the nation that God chose to be his peculiar people. And uh, God did choose them. God is their king. He loved the people. Um, and and it, multiple times it mentions in the scriptures, in the verses around it, how, how God just blessed them so much. But then it mentions how some, that they would just turn away from God and turn to idols. And you really get down to it in the, the very first place it's used in the word of God, Jeshurun, is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 15. And you see that that's a song of Moses. And uh, make note of the very last verse of Deuteronomy chapter 31. And do you remember what it says in Revelation chapter 15 about verse 3, where you see those who stand against the false Christ, they'll be on that sea of glass singing the song of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 31 even says, Their rock is not as our rock. You see, our rock is Jesus Christ, but many people will follow the false rock. But so Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 15, this is what it says. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Even pe many people lightly esteem, they despise our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ even though he died on the cross and resurrected for us, to give whomsoever will the opportunity for eternal life if they believe in Jesus Christ. Remember John 3, 16. But so God blessed them so much. But many people, when they're, when they're doing good, they just want to forget God. They, they wax fat. I mean, they start, they're just so doing so good. They, they just leave God out of the equation. And they start saying, oh, look what I did. How much greatness I have. Look what I've done. And they, they lightly esteem the rock of their salvation. They leave God, they leave Jesus Christ out of the equation. So when you think about Jeshurun, you always want to remember that. So Jeshurun, it's another name for Israel. It shows how, once again, they are that peculiar people. God is their king, just as he's the king of all people. But when you read about Jeshurun, you want to always remember that you do not want to go the way that they did when they just forgot God. So that's, that's what Jeshurun has to do with. And 
And then there's other places too, like where it will mention, uh, it'll say Jacob and Israel, and it's it's always Jacob is all twelve tribes, Israel many times is speaking of all twelve tribes, and so I, I hope that that answered your question. I said, and I've actually, yeah, I'll, I'll mention that there are times in the Word of God where um, Israel, how the house of Judah and the house of Israel became split after 1 Kings chapter 11. And sometimes when you read about Israel, it will only be referring to those 10 northern tribes. But many times Israel is referring to all 12 tribes. And even when we hear another week or two, we'll be getting to Ezekiel chapter 37 when you'll find out the house of Judah and the house of Israel. When Jesus Christ returns, those two sticks are going to be made one again and will be one family once again. And they truly are one family the 12 tribes of Israel. Many of you are of those 12 tribes of Israel, even though you might have been lied to and said that you weren't. Many lies are taught. One more question, Cecilia from New Brunswick. Then what are the angels proclaiming the gospel, the two witnesses and the 144,000 needed for then? If the church and, the, and HS were still on earth, and I, I think when you say HS, you're referring to the Holy Spirit. And this is so tragic. Cecilia, she thinks that the church is going to be gone and the Holy Spirit is going to be gone during the tribulation. Even though that's not what the Bible says at all. But I'm aware that people falsely teach that. And um, first of all, who do you, what do you think, who do you think the 144,000 are? Yeah, they're of the 12 tribes of Israel, but they're a part of the church. They serve Jesus Christ. First of all, what's it say in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28? It says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And I'm aware that some falsely teach that, oh, the Gentiles are going to be raptured away, but Israel is not. That's one of, that is completely false. First of all, no one's getting raptured away. But that idea is just completely false, made up by man. And it seems like more and more people are believing that. But it's not in God's word at all. What's it say about the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 14, verse 4? It says, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. That's spiritual. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. They follow Jesus Christ wherever they go. And you want to try to say they're not a part of the church? Of course they are. Anyone who believes in Jesus Christ is part of the church, whether they're an Israelite or a Gentile. These were redeemed from among men being the first fruit unto God and to the Lamb. And you mentioned the two witnesses you read in um, Revelation chapter 11 and Zechariah chapter 4 about them. They're going to be prophesying. They're going to be giving instructions. So, people who, so those who do love Jesus Christ, so they know what to do. And you know from Mark 13 that your job is to stand against the false Christ. And I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to when you said, what are the then what about the angels proclaiming the gospel? The only thing I could come up with, I think you must have been referring to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, where it says, Another angel having the everlasting gospel to preach to them on earth. And it says, Fear God and give glory to them, for the hour of his judgment is come. Well, what's that mean, the hour of judgment is come? That's talking about the very end. So it's just unthinkable that you would let some man tell you that the church is going to be gone. And it's, it's even probably crazier to say the Holy Spirit's going to be gone. That's not biblical. That doesn't make any sense at all. What do you read in Mark 13? That your job, the Christians, the church, those who truly serve Jesus Christ, their job is to stand against the false Christ and what does it say? It says, Do not even premeditate what you will say, for it is not you that speaks, but the Holy Spirit that speaks through you. And you would let someone tell you the Holy Spirit's not going to be here during the tribulation? That's one, that's one of the biggest lies that anyone could ever say in their whole life. That is false doctrine to the highest degree. And you see, many Christians... 
when they hear the Holy Spirit speak through the elect, which is the, uh, it's, the, it's God's elect who's going to stand against the false Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them, then many Christians who are, many Christians, they're going to hear the Holy Spirit speak through the elect, and they're going to realize that they were deceived and that they were worshiping Satan. Why? Because they listen to lies like the things that you are listening to. They listen to lies that people said, you're going to be gone. And that is an absolute lie. I have to go and I have to read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses... We're going to read about verses 1 through 8 maybe. Somewhere around there. Let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Picking it up. Verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. And it reads, Now we beseech you, brethren... By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him. Now that word coming is parousia in the Greek. The same word that's used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. So you know we're talking about the same subject here as we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. Verse 2, That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. That's the subject. Three, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. The, the day of Christ, our gathering together to Jesus Christ, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, that Satan, when he arrives, is the false Christ. For who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That could not have been more clear. We will not be gathered together to Jesus Christ until after the deception of Satan as the false Christ. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Verse 6, And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. That word withholdeth, the Greek word is katecho. It means to hold down or to restrain. It's the same Greek word that's going to be used as translated as letteth in verse 7. So, let's go, let's go ahead and read it. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There is much deception even taught in the world today, which is obvious by people teaching that, that the church and the Holy Spirit is going to be gone during the tribulation. That's a, what a complete lie. That's the mystery of iniquity working already. They're all, are all right. So, the mystery of iniquity already works. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So that word letteth, once again, it means to hold down. So this is teaching us that, yes, the mystery of iniquity, it already works, but the full power of it is still held down. It's still restrained until, like it says, until he be taken out of the way. Well, what's that talking about? Verse, let's read verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So that full power, it's held down. Until what? Until he be taken out of the way. Until Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9 comes to pass. That's when Satan is cast out onto this earth. That's when he will have the most power that God will ever, ever allow him to have. So yeah, the mystery of iniquity already works, but his power, Satan's power, it's still held down. It's still restrained. But when he is cast out onto this earth, like I said, he will have the most power that God will ever, ever allow him to have. Satan will actually be here in person, and he will be disguised as Christ, claiming to be Christ. Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Why? Because it is Satan. And his role as the Antichrist. Satan has many different roles. With all power and signs and lying wonders, his miracles are going to be absolutely incredible. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and then that perish, 
because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. I mean, if you don't want to study God's word for yourself, if you want to stay in unrighteousness and listen to false doctrine, God will even send you strong delusion. God will let you be deceived if you want to listen to lies and not study the Word of God for yourself. Verse 12 to complete. That they might all be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, what is such an important chapter. And 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, both teaching you so much. Basically, the main subject of both of those books is the return of Jesus Christ. And we learn in the, in the Scriptures over and over and over, we will not be gathered together to Jesus Christ until after the deception of Satan as the false Christ. Mark 13, many other places, it's written over and over and over that deception will come. You know from 1 Corinthians 15, if you're still in the flesh, then Jesus Christ has not returned. You be ready for that deception. The false Christ is coming. Do not listen to lies by false prophets. What good would, be, would we be if we were gone? Our job is to stand against the false Christ and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. Do not be deceived. Wait on the true Christ to return. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word in this place you've given us. We can teach your word. We thank you for the prophecy of your word and telling us exactly how it all goes down. We thank you for making sure we know just to stick to your word only. We just ask you to continue to give us understanding of your word. We ask you for a continuing understanding of your prophecy so we can learn more to get more details about how the end goes down. Of course, not just for ourselves, but so we can share it with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the precious name. Amen. This was recorded in the year 2023 at Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.